Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. I knew that there was no way that I was going to be able to put all of these stories into one video unless it was going to be a very long video. So what I'm going to do is focus on the murdered and missing. I'm going to bring as much information as I can to each of the stories. And then I'm going to talk about some of the suspects. Now, this led into this whole highway uh, of stories about missing, murdered, young people that took place in Canada in the areas between Toronto and Ontario between the years of the early to mid 1950s through the late 1970s. Detectives put together what they could and some believe that there were multiple serial killers. London, Ontario lies in the southwestern portion of the province a little over a hundred miles from Toronto. It's the definition of an average city. But from 1959 through 1984, London, Ontario saw an unprecedented spike in unsolved murders that were believed to be committed by at least one and probably several serial killers. Many theories have been put forth as to what made London in particular so attractive to predators. Perhaps the opening of a new highway to the previously secluded area brought in more visitors and transplants, which in turn brought hunters, they're talking about human hunters, prey, predators. Um, now, this guy, this Artfeld, who wrote this book, his theory was that there was a serial killer capital that London, Ontario was potentially North America's serial killer capital in the 1960s and 70s. It was fertile ground for homicides because of the location near the new highway 401. It was the continent's first cities with urban controlled highway access. This, he believes this allowed people to drop into these little small towns, abduct a child or a young woman, murder them, dispose of them, and then go on their way. Um, whatever the reason, somewhere around 30 murders took place in a very short period of time. One of these occurring on January the 6th, 1956. This is the sad and tragic unsolved murder of six-year-old Susan Cadeau. Born December the 21st, 1950 in London, Ontario. She was the daughter of Walter and Gabrielle and had two older brothers named Patrick and Michael. Playing with her friends around St. Mary's School, not far from her home. Now this is the first case that I've read about that sounds similar to Tracy Ann Bruni which didn't take place until 1975, which would have been 20 years later. At around 7.45 p.m., a man approached Susan and said that he had something for her. To put the children at ease, he told them that he lived nearby and that he was at the school so he could meet with the priest. Susan apparently found no reason to be afraid of the man and began to walk away with him. It so happened that at that moment, another one of the children slipped and fell on the ice, which everyone ran over to check on her and made them completely forget about the strange man walking away with their friend. Now, he had told Susan that he had a gift for her, and he wanted to take her with him to get this gift. He put the children at ease, talking to them, 
Uh, he mentioned the priest, Father O'Rourke, and said he was there to see him and that they were friends. So this kind of put the children at ease. Before they knew it, Susan was gone, and within 15 minutes had passed and she had not come back. Her brothers became alarmed and ran home to get their parents. A frantic search began immediately, and by 9.30 that night, the police were out looking for Susan. There were around 300 people who came out to help search, railroad workers, Boy Scouts, police, and just people from the community. At 10.08 the next morning, a father and son search team found Susan's fully clothed, lifeless body a little more than a kilometer and a half from her home. She was laying by the Canadian Pacific Railway, 10 feet off of a driveway of a construction company. There were footprints in the snow, those of a child, and they were believed to have been hers. So they believed that whoever took her out there to walked her out there and killed her there. The jeans she had been wearing beneath her snow paints were missing, and her underwear were torn. An autopsy was conducted at Victoria Hospital by coroner Paul Sweeney. He said that she had been dead probably less than three hours. Her body was not frozen enough for her to have been out there longer than that, he said. Investigators centered around the tall, thin stranger who had approached the children in the school playground that day. Susan's brothers provided an excellent description of him, which they used for a sketch that was put out by the media. The boys say he looked to be between the ages of 35 and 40. He was tall and very thin and needed a shave the way they described it. He didn't have like a full beard, but just scruffy, unshaven. They said that he was wearing a brown coat and galoshes that had buckles on them and a hat with ear flaps like a Russian-style hat. A team of 22 detectives began to work on Susan's case and went out into the communities and in neighboring communities speaking with known sexual deviants. A mass was held for Susan at St. Mary's the Sunday after her death. In the weeks that passed, more vagrants were grilled by police, but no charges ever came for anyone. Police believe that Susan's death was not an isolated incident. Susan's death punctuated a series of unsolved sexual assaults. At least 10 London children in public places over the preceding year. When they found Susan's body, they, she did have a shoelace, a boot, from a boot, um, wrapped around her throat very tightly. However, the coroner said this was not the cause of death, that she died from exposure. She didn't freeze to death because he said that her body was not in a frozen state, that she had only been out in the elements for a few hours. It's possible that she did die from this ligature strangulation, but they said that they believe she lived for a while after she was outside because she had frozen tears on her face. I believe, personally, that he took Susan someplace and um, raped her, assaulted her and then brought her back out there and killed her because they said that children's uh, footprints were in the snow and they believed that they were Susan's and um, so I believe he got her out of the car walked her out there and strangled her to death with this boot lace now this will come into play later this this will come in uh, will factor in later in some of the future stories that I'm going to talk about where some of these other uh, murder victims also were strangled with uh, uh, articles of clothing. This could have been the same killer. Another factor in Susan's case was that they said that she was wearing jeans underneath her snow paints. Now, she had her snow paints, but her jeans were not there. This will also come in to some future stories where some articles of clothing from some of these victims was taken. 
So a lot of people do believe that this was the same killer. Now, in the case of some of the older women and, and teenage girls later that I'll talk about, their bodies had been posed in, in certain positions, and there was no mention of that with Susan, so I don't know if that happened or not. But by the time that the man brought the little girl Susan out there to murder her, to finally just do, you know do away with her, I think that he knew that he was being looked for, that it was probably in the news, and people, there were over 300 people were coming the neighborhoods looking for her, so he had to take her someplace where he could make a quick getaway. Susan's name resurfaced in the news in February of 1998, when London police and Ontario police put together a joint task force they named Project Angel and they combined forces to look into 20 unsolved slayings in the London, Ontario, and surrounding areas. 14 of the 20 victims were from London, Ontario. Susan was the project's youngest victim. The oldest victim was a 66-year-old woman named Irene Gibbons whose body had been found in 1975. Project Angel was believed to be the largest reopening of old murder cases in the country's history. Project Angel investigators applied new science to old murders, using DNA testing from the fluid samples of blood, semen, and saliva found on the bodies that was kept. But in the end of Susan's story, no serial killer was ever revealed. All of these cases remain unsolved. A man fitting this description just so happened was also a person of interest in a much more famous 1959 case of 12-year-old Lynn Harper. At the time of her death, Lynn was living on the Canadian, the Royal Canadian Air Force Base in uh that was approximately 50 miles from Ontario. On the evening of June 5th, 1959, Lynn was at a park with some friends when she was spotted by her 14-year-old friend, Stephen. He lived nearby on the base with his family. Lynn asked Stephen to give her a ride up the road on his bike so she could look at some ponies and Stephen said that he was traveling in that direction anyway, so he agreed. According to Stephen's account later, he let Lynn off of his bike at the spot where she went to look at the horses. He then turned and headed back down the lane. At that point, he turned around and saw Lynn getting into a car. This was the last time she was seen alive. Two days later, Lynn's body was found very near to the place where she was last seen. She had been raped and strangled with her own blouse. Police immediately suspected that 14-year-old Stephen was the culprit, and they took him into custody, grilling him for hours. But Stephen did not give in. He stuck to his guns. He claimed that he did not have anything to do with hurting his friend and that he saw her getting into a vehicle. Despite his professions of innocence, he was arrested and charged, and much of the evidence against him seemed flimsy. He was eventually found guilty and sentenced to hang. His death sentence was commuted to life in prison a year later, but in 1969, he was released on parole, and he changed his name and moved away. Much later, after the intervention of the Innocence Project, his conviction was overturned, and in 2008, he was awarded a substantial amount of money for what was termed a miscarriage of justice. It has since been speculated that the actual killer of Lynn Harper was a man named Alexander Kalachuk. He was also a suspect in the 1956 murder of six-year-old Susan Cadeau. Kalachuk had served in the Royal Canadian Army and the Air Force, and he lived only a little 
way away from the Air Force Base. He was married and had three children. Three weeks prior to Lynn Harper's murder, Kalachuk was arrested for attempting to lure a 10-year-old girl into his car by offering her a pair of panties. Though he was released a week later due to lack of evidence, he, has also, he had also been reported for indecent exposure by someone at the airbase where he was stationed. He was briefly hospitalized for anxiety and sexual deviation, but after his release, he moved to another base where reports of his questionable behavior began to bubble to the surface. It was well known in his area that he was known to prowl the area in his car, watching for young girls and trying to lure them inside. In the late 1950s, a shocking murder took place near Royal Canadian Air Force Base in southwestern Ontario. Twelve-year-old Cheryl Lynn Harper, as she went by Lynn, was the daughter of Flying Officer Leslie Harper, a supply officer posted on the base, and his wife, um, Shirley Harper. On June 9, 1959, Lynn disappeared after being seen double riding on a bike with one of her friends, 14-year-old Stephen Truscott. Stephen Truscott and Harper had been classmates in the 7th and 8th grade class at nearby Hugh Campbell School located on the military base where they lived. The two were seen together on the evening of June ninth, riding along a country road north of the base. They were heading toward the highway. Shortly after, Truscott was seen riding alone on the same road heading back toward his home. He would later state that he dropped her off on Highway 8, saying that there were some horses and that she wanted to go and look at the horses. Truscott left her there, and as he was riding away, he says that when he looked back, he saw her getting into a white car. Harper never returned home that evening, and her father reported her missing at 11 p.m. that night. The Ontario police led a search team of around 250 military police, and civilians. Two days later, on the afternoon of June 11th, searchers discovered her body in a nearby farm woodlot. Harper was partially nude and had been raped and strangled with her own blouse. The owner of the farm, Bob Lawson, had actually gone to the courthouse, or the guardhouse of the, of the base and reported seeing a strange car parked on his property near the fence the evening that Harper disappeared. Lawson stated that he and his neighbor Ross Critch had seen a man in the driver's seat and what appeared, appeared to be a little girl uh, sitting in the seat next to him, but they said they did not recognize either one of them. The officer on duty didn't seem to be very interested in this and never followed up on it. Lawson was told that a suspect had already been arrested and charged. Now, this was 14-year-old Stephen Truscott, who was her friend. But they weren't interested in investigating anybody else. They just assumed that this 14-year-old boy had raped her and murdered her, and they um, just did a very brief investigation and charged him. Truscott was quickly arrested and charged two days after her body was found. Graham's investigation never explained how Truscott could have committed the rape and murder, yet he did not appear to be out of breath, sweating, scratched. His clothing was not in disorder, and he was not dirty or anything else when he returned home. After only a few minutes of having dropped her off at this uh, farm. 
on September 30th, 1959, only three months into it, um, he was sentenced to death by hanging. He would become the youngest person in Canadian history to be given the death sentence. Truscott's sentence was so shocking to the government that it commuted his sentence to life in prison in 1960. During his incarceration, Truscott never wavered, pro proclaiming his innocence, but it fell on deaf ears and all of his appeals were denied. He was given parole in 1969 after serving 10 years in prison. He went into prison when he was 14 years old. He was paroled in 1969 and originally went to live with his parole officer and his family. Truscott later moved to Ontario where he lived anonymously and worked as a millwright. And he changed his name. He later married and had uh, three children. It wasn't until the year 2000 when Truscott reemerged in an interview on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation news program, which had revived interest in this case. In November 2001, an appeal was filed by the Association of Defense of the Wrongly uh, Convicted. This is kind of like the Innocence Project that we have here. An appeal of Truscott's conviction was heard by the Court of Appeals on June the 19th, 2006, a five-judge panel heard his case, reheard the evidence, and he was formally acquitted of the charges, although no declaration of innocence was made, something Truscott had hoped the court would do. He wanted to be considered innocent because he never stopped claiming to be innocent. Now, they did interview her father, who was still alive at this time. He was 90 years old, living in a nursing home. And he never stopped believing that Stephen Truscott was his daughter's killer. Now, in July of 2008, Truscott was awarded $6.5 million compensation for his wrongful conviction and his time spent in prison. And her family was very upset about this. They said it was a travesty. So who really killed Lynn Harper? There have been several other suspects that have come up over the years, including a pedophile who had been convicted, and he was also someone who lived near the Royal Air Force Base at the time of Lynn Harper's death. There were several other suspects that have been thought of over the years including one who lived at the Royal Air Force Base at the time of her death, and he was a convicted pedophile. However, none of the other suspects were ever taken seriously by the Ontario police. They never investigated anyone else seriously, despite the fact that their own police officers brought up this man's name and said that they thought it was someone that they should really consider looking into. Now, another suspect was Alexander Kalachuk, whose name came up in the case of Susan Cadu, and he was a suspect. Um, he was a Royal Canadian Air Force Sergeant, and he lived and worked in the area at the time of these two deaths. About three weeks before Lynn Harper's death, Kalachuk was arrested and charged for attempting to lure three young girls into his car. On the same day that Lynn Harper disappeared, a local Air Force medical officer held a discussion about Kalachuk and said that he was drinking heavily and be, be, behaving bizarrely. His probation officer advised of an incident of indecent exposure not far from the base. On July the 2nd, three weeks after the murder of Lynn Harper, Kalachuk was hospitalized due to overwhelming anxiety and depression. Now this comes into a story 
uh, that I'll be talking about later on about a little boy who went missing. And they said that the man, and they never did name the man by name, but one of the suspects in his case was someone who they said would often have himself admitted into mental hospitals. In 2006, Harper's body was exhumed from her grave in Ontario in the very small hope that there might still be some DNA evidence on the body. So it says that they destroyed all the evidence in Lynn Harper's case, but they did do an autopsy on her because they did talk about the last meal that she ate and how long they thought that it had been since she had eaten. And they did say that she had been raped, so they did do a rape exam on her as well. So I don't understand why they didn't keep any of this. I guess that once Stephen was convicted, they didn't think that they would need to. The fact that Stephen never wavered from his story that he dropped her off there and saw her getting into a car. He never changed that story in all the time that he was being interviewed. In all the years he spent in prison, he never once said he changed his story at all. And... Um, Stephen Truscott's original law lawyers were never told about key evidence, including um, testimony from some of her classmates that um, Lynn was known to be a frequent hitchhiker and she had run away from home and that the day she ran away, the day she disappeared, she had told a classmate that she was running away from home that evening and going to her grandmother's. This was never brought up in court. The lawyers for Stephen was never given this information. Now, would this have helped their case? I don't know. It might have just sounded like victim blaming, but the defense lawyer said that on the day that Lynn Harper went missing, she had told a classmate that she was planning to run away to her grandmother's house who lived 130 kilometers away. The girl was upset because her parents wouldn't let her go swimming. Um, this evidence was not brought up in court. It goes to the probability that Lynn Harper could have asked Stephen for a ride out there that day because she was uh, meeting someone. Now, in the appeal, this evidence was brought up in the appeal, and the judges heard this evidence. The jury only heard from her parents who testified that Lynn did, was never known to hitchhike. But a classmate of hers came forward and said that she often hitchhiked. She had a habit of hitchhiking. And her parents were aware of this, according to the friend. This was just something that came up that she was known to hitchhike. She had told a friend that she was running away and going to her grandmother's house because she was angry with her parents at the time. And this should have been brought up in court, in my opinion, because this would have said, well, there's a good possibility that after Stephen dropped her off, as he said that he did, and he said that he saw her getting into a car, and the owner of the farm um, reported a strange car in the neighborhood, why did they not even take the time to look into that and to kind of look around to see if there was such a car in the area at the time? I don't know. But they say Lynn's case will probably never be solved because all of the evidence is gone and so much time has passed, even her body being exhumed and tested again for DNA and they could find nothing. Well, they didn't find Stephen's DNA on her body either. So, that's how the story comes to an end, and I know this video was rather long, but I didn't want to just talk about this quick little story about her. It's possible that this Kalachuk was guilty of murdering her and Susan. 
some people believe that Stephen Truscott was guilty of murdering um, Lynn, and others believe that it was just an injustice and that the police never really searched for another possibility. But either way, Lynn died at the age of 12. She was murdered, raped, and whoever did it was never um, solved. And there are so many more cases in that area that it just goes on and on. I am going to be covering a few more of these. I, I do think that there was more than one person involved here. And none of these cases have ever been solved, really solved. This new uh, Project Angel and Cold Case detectives are working on trying to solve some of these. And with the uh, invention of DNA and, and technology, maybe they can, but as the years pass and, and these cases get older and older, the possibility of them being solved gets colder. But I appreciate everyone for watching. I know this video was a little bit long. But I did want to tell as much as I could about both Susan and Lynn. And thanks for watching.